Well, hello everyone. Things are heating up, but guess what? Don't be scared. Don't be scared. It's going to be exciting. Okay, well, welcome to the beginning of the last days, everyone. My name is Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, everywhere I go, um, all over Rumble and YouTube, have you seen the amount of people that are talking about end day prophecies and the fulfillment of what is going on in the world and how it relates to, you know, the potential and the return of Jesus and the end of days, and uh, more importantly, the excitement of uh, a whole new, a whole new world. Um, I remember when I first met my husband, uh, you know, he was saying, so you believe all that revelation stuff? So I had to like school him just a little and we got talking about it, you know, and, and, uh, he came to faith, um, in, in a short season, but it was like all that. He asked me specifically all that revelation stuff. Cause it's kind of, you know, it's really something when you read it. Right. So my dad, uh, you know, I love to read from my dad's Bible, every single show. And he has marked up revelations. My dad clearly loved revelations and um, just a lot that he has found to be very significant. And of course, it's, you know, the horsemen and the plagues and the seals are opened and who, you know, who can fully understand it? Well, our guest today coming up is going to help us to understand something that is going to make your heart sing. Let me tell you, you do not need to fear. You need to be aware but you need to understand the seasons and, and the times. And I'm, I'm really happy to say that this guy understands that. Um, so in Revelations 19, I only read what my dad has underlined. And it's, it's a cool verse. And it says uh, in verse 4, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen and Hallelujah. <laughs> so even the beasts are going to worship God. Uh, I don't think the uh, the terrible beast is going to be doing much worshiping. He he um, should be doing things differently than he's doing because it's not going to go well at the end of days for evil and all of those uh, beasts and beings who did evil in the sight of God. Um, so, okay, we just got through, uh, you know, seeing some major things this year. Uh, we had the eclipse not long ago and, uh, well, Yes, not long ago at all, just uh, hours. Uh, but the the absolutely phenomenal thing that I'm seeing is that there is a movement across the world of people turning to Scripture and wanting to know, like, what does this mean? What does that mean? The, the heavens declare the glory and the power of the living God. So what does it all mean? And we kind of get scared when we see that those horses, uh, you know, the black horse and the red horse, oh, you know, like death is coming and all kinds of things that are kind of spoken of. But but what does it mean to us? And, and what is the provision that God has for those that trust him? So let me introduce you to one of the uh, uh, most amazing people. He was recommended to me by, by my good friend, Fred Weening. Of course, we've had Fred on the show. He was at our huge event. I'm sorry about my dog having a absolute coughing fit behind me, but... Um, so, uh, Fred says, you gotta have this guy. You gotta have this guy. It's so exciting. He's, you know, he unpacks scripture in a way that we can understand the, the kingdom, right? And what is about to transpire. I said, all right, I'm going to do it. So Benjamin Thomas, uh, prior to becoming an author, Benjamin founded or co-founded several successful businesses. He acquired over 30 businesses in his career and developed nearly a dozen commercial properties. He currently serves as the principal of Novington Capital, a private investment firm. He earned both an engineering degree and a master's in business. So we welcome you to the show, Benjamin. Thanks for waiting in the background there. How are you today? Oh, great. I'm great. How are you, uh, Laura Lynn? Great to be here. It, it really is uh, so good to talk about these things because everybody's a bit worried. And uh, in fact, they're a bit stressed out, I think, Benjamin. And the reason I wanted to have you on is because you have studied scripture so intensely as to really understand 
uh, that we're we're actually in the most exciting time in history to have ever been born. That's how you feel about it. Absolutely. You know, uh, Laura Lynn, I came from, you know, a classic evangelical upbringing where I was taught that things just get worse and worse. And then one day, uh, you know, Jesus comes and, and takes us to heaven. And so as I became educated in, in what Satan was up to, frankly, uh, it scared me and I wasn't sure what was um, what was next. But thank God the Lord opened up the scripture to me. And I now believe we are in the best time in all of human history to be alive. So when when you say that, let's understand that, um, I mean, we've never been closer to World War Three. Uh, we can't afford our groceries anymore. And uh, <laughs> just to give some perspective, uh, so so how do we um, how do we deem to see this world? It's not necessarily that uh, that natural things uh, can work well. Do you think that something's going to happen though? I know uh, I want to put up your two books if we could, JT. There just to give you uh, the audience an understanding. You have written two books: Kingdom Age of the Saints and Blast of Fire. Blast of Fire. Um, has just come out and Kingdom Age um, of, of the Saints um, has uh, been out for a while and is doing very, very well because you're explaining the, the kingdom. And you talk in, in Blast of Fire about uh, Donald Trump and how his life is totally fitting in with, with Scripture. I, that's right. So Kingdom Age of the Saints uh, was released in October of last year. And... Uh, it describes what, where we are in God's timeline and what is next and how it's the end times for the new world order, not for the church. And that revelation came to me um, in this room where I'm sitting in my study, really seeking God about what is next for humanity and why do I feel such a peace, even though, like you said, inflation's running rampant. It seems like there's no justice anywhere. Uh, we were in America, we were faced with a, a stolen election in 2020. And even though all these things were happening, I had such a piece I couldn't explain, Laura Lynn. And that really put me in, in, put me into the word of God and really in prayer and said, Lord, what is going on? Where are we on your timeline? And when the Lord showed me, I realized we are in the best time to be alive because it's the, it's the time just preceding what I've called my book, which is the kingdom age of the saints. It's a time when God sets things right on earth and his saints get into positions of leadership and authority. And that is when we see these horrible things happening around us. And I know I've been following the news of what's happening in Canada with your laws and with the government there. It's easy to panic about those things, but, but the Bible calls those birth pains for something new. And so that something new is the kingdom age of the saints. And that's what I'm really looking forward to. So how do you see that? And should we talk about the stone judgment first? Because you, you talk about the stone judgment. Um, so, so lay it out for us. Sure. Well, in the book of Daniel, God showed Daniel a, a statue. And that statue represented four secular evil empires that in the Bible, when it talks about a secular empire, it, it calls it a beast. And so that's a, a strange word for us, but that's what the Bible calls it. And so these beasts are these secular empires that govern the world. And at the end of his vision, the fourth beast, which is rooted in ancient Rome, is judged. And it says a, a stone made without hands will come from heaven, will destroy the feet of the statue and pulverize all four of the pieces of the statue that constitute those those four secular pagan empires and so that is called the stone judgment and that event is almost never talked about in fact i've talked to many friends i've looked for books on it it's not discussed really anywhere but it is the next major judgment event for humanity and it's what will usher us into the next age and so the stone judgment is really a judgment that happens before uh, the Battle of Armageddon. It is, it is a judgment that we can look forward to to set us free from the death grip of you know, the cabal that we see that's running our world right now. So that's very good news. So you believe that Scripture 
points us to a time where there is victory, where it is not solid injustice and a two-tier system of justice definitely going on in the, the United States and, and uh, you know, a very evil, um, we would call him a dictator here in Canada as well. You know, we're having a problem with uh, what's been coming against us. And you were just mentioning like different laws, like hate crimes. I mean, we're about to potentially uh, be given tough sentences like life imprisonment for speaking hate, but we can't quite determine, it, hate is not exactly defined. So it's not just, uh, you know, telling people that they should, you know, start inflicting violence on others. It could be hateful in that we don't agree with a certain agenda that the left agrees with. Now that could be hateful to them. So it's, it's problematic. But are you saying that we are going to see an age where the kingdom people, the people of God see justice and see prosperity in a sense. Absolutely. You know, the Bible says God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. And so when you think about judgment, think about it like a, a cup. And when it's full of iniquity, that's when God moves. And so when he moved in Egypt, you know, Pharaoh had started to, uh, for instance, kill the firstborn and get into genocide of children. And that's when he raised up Moses. In fact, Moses came out of that genocide and uh, just through a divine switch became a ruler of, um, of Israel and, and, and helped redeem uh, Israel from Egypt. So when the iniquity of these empires gets to a point, then God judges. And when he judges, he sets his people free. You know, we don't like to talk about judgment that much, uh, but in fact, there's a scripture that talks about judgment unto victory. And when you think about the time of Noah, when God judged the entire world, he put Noah in charge of the world. When he judged Pharaoh, which was the most powerful empire on earth, he then put his people Israel in charge. And so there's a third major judgment in the Bible called the stone judgment. And it is very significant scripturally and it is the next major biblical event. And it's a, it's a judgment that will set things right. And so all the things that you're talking about, whether it be hate speech laws in Canada or in America here, where you know there's concerns that our election system is just sort of permanently um, disabled. Uh, all of those things are, are really last gasps of an enemy that is absolutely doomed to fail and will fall supernaturally in this stone judgment. Wow. I'm looking forward to that. So what do you rely on for that, uh, Benjamin? Like, where can we, uh, and definitely we want to get your books and we want to show everyone how to get your books so they can study it more in depth. But if you could show me, where is the Bible leading us to give us this hope? Well, Daniel 2 uh, is really the first um, specific mention of the four empires that would rule the planet. Uh, ending with that fourth beast. And I talk a lot about the fourth beast in my books, how he came to power. And it's really, um, it was very humbling to recognize that Jesus also in his earthly ministry walked during the time of the fourth beast. It's the Roman system. And Jesus at that time did not do anything about it, right? He, he had his ministry. Um, he gave us power and spiritual authority over the devil but he didn't address Rome. He didn't address the political system at the time because he knew there would be a day where he would take it away and he would judge it, but that wasn't the time. But he gave us clues about that, Laura Lynn. He told us, he, he started talking about the third day. On the third day, my church will rise. And so that's not just talking about his physical body in the grave, but it's talking about his followers. And so the third day, uh, biblically uh, speaking, is 2029. That's that's 2,000 years exactly after Jesus um, uh, was raised. And we're getting very, very close to the third day of the church. And Jesus promised that on the third day, I'll raise up my church. And so you see signs not only in his um, parables, but his stories. And you also connect the dots with Daniel, where it says that after this empire, 
controls the world. And then we hear about more about the fourth beast in, in the in the revelation. When things get really bad, that's when this stone judgment occurs and set things right. Wow. And 2029 then, so that's a significant year, are you saying? Very significant. It's the end of the second day, biblical day of the church, and the beginning of the third um, you know, day of the church. And Jesus said, on the third day, my body will rise. And in fact, the only time he spoke to Rome, um, remember when King Herod, uh, the, the Jews at the time, the Pharisees said, Herod wants to kill you. And he said, you go tell that fox, today I'll cast out devils, I believe, tomorrow I will heal the sick, and on the third day I'll finish my course. That was the only time he really spoke to Rome at, in, in the Bible, and even that led toward, okay, I'm going to do my work in the spiritual realm and you know heal the sick and cast out demons, but on the third day I'm going to finish my course against you, Rome. And so that's what's exciting about 2029. Uh, I believe there'll be blessings for his church even before then, but I see that as a major marker uh, prophetically in the Word of God. Wow. Um, you, uh, on, on your, your second book, uh, Blast of Fire, you, so you're featuring President Trump, and uh, why, what, what do you see in Scripture that tells us about the significance of this very unusual man, Donald Trump, that has been extremely polarizing with, uh, you know, a lot of people, even the evangelicals or, you know, Christians uh, have had problems. And then the heathens, well, they just blame him. And then there's Trump derangement syndrome that is definitely going on over at CNN there right now. But how, uh, what have you found in scripture that talks about his, his uh, likeness, I guess? Well, Laura Lynn, after I finished Revelation Riddle, uh, the, the first book, Kingdom Age of the Saints, I really really felt led to pick up and study a, a book called Two Ezra. Some, some people call it Four Ezra, but it is a book that was recently removed from the evangelical canon. And when I say recent, I'm talking about 200 years ago. Okay, so it was in the Bible for you know, almost 2,000 years, but 200 years ago, uh, it was taken out. And as I studied that book of Two Ezra, I started to see this mysterious character called the man out of the sea. And this was somebody that came out of the world. This was somebody that um, is said had a, a, a tongue that had sparks. It said this was somebody that um, the whole world would fight afraid. And uh, this was somebody that God would use to redeem humanity. And so as I studied that, and as I looked into that, and also saw the sequence in the book of two Ezra, where it says that humanity would experience a near death experience. In other words, the evil in the world would plot to destroy humanity. Then Jesus as a lion out of the forest would judge the fourth beast. And then the next chapter, this man of the sea appears and he has a role to play in redeeming humanity. And I just started connecting the dots and I said, that's got to be President Trump. Just with the timing and the description, it says he's a civilian. It says that he is someone that um, is has this fiery tongue. You know, the, I mean, the mean tweets are in the Bible, Laura Lynn. I mean, that's that's amazing to me that wow. 2,500 years ago, <laughs> 2,500 years ago, God saw this time and he had a plan. And so that's why we don't need to fear Laura Lynn. You know, if you think about it, 200 years before uh, Babylon, even, even people knew about it, God raised up Cyrus and he started to talk about Cyrus as this great redeemer uh, of Israel uh, from Babylon. And hundreds of years before Egypt went into slavery, God started talking to Abram about his divine plan. And so before um, Rome even got started, God laid out a plan to take it down and to put his people in charge and so that's good news the fact that all of these things were written so long ago and he had a plan the whole time so maybe could i ask you a few things so um yeah. we know that before christ's return there's uh the, the third temple and um is, is that your understanding as well like people read you know 
have different interpretations of, of the timeline. Um, but there's this huge battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39, talking about everyone coming against the Jews. And then God shows up and he basically rescues them. And then they see him as the Messiah. When you talk about the kingdom age, then does, uh, when, how would you put that in a timeline together with this huge battle that might signal the return of Christ to some people? Sure. So the kingdom age is a period of um, spirit-led believers, uh, basically as uh, agents in running a kingdom here on earth that is godly, it is righteous, it is a period of hundreds of years, possibly even a thousand, that falls um, before the Great Tribulation. And so in the book of Enoch, it actually talks about when we are to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. And we're supposed to build that temple for our Lord Yeshua, okay? And that is at the end of this next age. And so in my timeline, uh, which I have on my website and also in the books, there's the kingdom age of the saint. There's the stone judgment, then this kingdom age of the saints, then the great tribulation, and uh, I'm sorry, then a, a rapture, if you will. We, we get called into the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we marry. Jesus marries a church now perfected, now glorified. And then at the end of that great tribulation is the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. So essentially, I'm seeing now a period of time or a chapter in the next age that happens before all of the other things that we've been studying. You know, the church is really focused on the future, you know, the Antichrist and all of these things that happen way into the future. But in fact, there is a judgment of humanity that happens before all of that and ushers in a whole new kingdom age, which is almost like the Lord is taking us back to a type of Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden was not a place, it, it was not heaven. I mean, Satan was in the garden. Uh, there was temptation in the garden. It was a, a, a type and a shadow of where, how God intended humanity to operate. And so this kingdom age of the saints is talked about in a riddle in the book of Revelation. It's talked about in the book of Daniel. It says that after this stone judgment, God will give his kingdom to the saints. It is not the millennial reign. It is, an, is a chapter in the age before the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, so so do you believe that this that you're talking about, um, so for people that are deathly afraid and and are living with anxiety and, you know, they look at Matthew 24, wars, rumors of wars, cataclysmic uh, happenings, earthquakes, uh, we're seeing it all. Um, mm -hmm. Signs in the heavens, we're seeing it. Um, and it, it says, uh, you know, like not to be afraid, this is not the end. And then there's parts of the scripture that says that unless the Lord shortened the days, that uh, there would be no one left. So, right. so um, how do we um, tie and mesh all of those things? So when it talks about in Matthew 24, wars and rumors of wars, you got to go back to the question that was asked by the disciples. They said, Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age? And before I started getting into this, I didn't really understand that there would be an age that ends and a new age that begins. And when Jesus, he answered their third question first, he said, they said, what are the signs of the end of this age? And so when he says wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places, if you notice at the end of that um, section, he says, these are all birth pains for something new. So when a, when a woman is in labor and she's, she's having pain, it's about to give a new a birth to a new life that comes into the world. And so wars and rumors and wars and, and, you know, the kind of the evil that we see in the world are all birth pains to the next age. And when you see that, you start to realize, wow, so we're actually, we get to witness the end of an old age and the beginning of a new age. And when you start seeing that 
there's an old age and a and a new age and you see that in the book of Ezra you also see it in Hebrews when it's it talks about um, those that have tasted of the powers of the age to come in Hebrews 6 it also says in Hebrews 4 that um, the rest that there still remains a rest to the people of God and that's after Jesus had already come so what is this rest he's talking about what is this next age he's talking about he's talking about the end of a 12 day 12,000 year age as outlined in the book of Ezra and the beginning of a new age same earth but the next age is starts the first chapter of that age is the kingdom age of the saints where God's glory falls and there's a massive revival and there is billions of people come to the Lord and so that is what we have to look forward to and when you see it you start seeing it all over the Bible Wow Wow um, so so this should be and this should be bringing a lot of hope to everyone that you're seeing so when you begin to see it you see it in one part of the scripture and then you begin to see that uh, coinciding with other parts of scripture that are confirming that this is going to be epic this is an a, a, it's not only epic, um, but if you go back into Ezra's books, he actually, the Lord says to him about 2,500 years ago, he says, this age that we're in is getting old. It's getting tired. It'll get even more evil as it draws to an end. And he said, there are 12 days in this age and two and a half days are left. And so biblically speaking, that's a 12,000 year age. And he says there's two and a half thousand more years left. Well, I went back and, and looked at that and, and he told Ezra that about 2,500 years ago. And so when you start to realize that the old age ends and a new age begins, it starts to explain a lot of scriptures when the disciples say, Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age? And so that, the whole Bible starts to come alive because now you realize what the disciples are talking about. And in fact, after in the book of Acts, when they started to preach, it was Peter and John in the temple. And they said that Jesus is going to stay in heaven until the days when all things have been made right on earth. And that, that message just infuriated the uh, Sadducees and they tried to arrest them while they were speaking. But he was basically, they knew that this age would end and that a new age would begin and that Jesus would stay in heaven until all things have been made right on earth. And so that is what we have to look forward to. You know, the church is not ready. We're not ready to, to, to marry our, our Lord. There is so much, um, compromise that we have. I mean, I'm here in Washington, DC, Laura Lynn, I'll drive around town and there's, there's a, there's an LGBTQ flag on almost every church in the whole city. We are not ready to meet our Lord and marry uh, and, and, and go through that marriage ceremony. We need this next age to get us ready. We need the glory to fall. We need revival. We need to be purified. And we're not ready to meet the Lord, but one day we will be. And, when, and he's going to marry a, a spotless bride without blemish. He's going to marry a glorified bride. And we're going to need this next age to be ready for him. You know, uh, when uh, when we're doing shows like this, we can see people in the in the feeds, and we've got one guy pretty upset. He doesn't like Trump at all, so he's like not buying the uh, you know your uh, interpretation of this. And and then some people saying that um, you know that uh, you know other people say other things, and so there's a lot of controversy. I'm sure you find. Do you get that? kind of and and the reason that i like to have um folks like yourself on is if you can verify through scripture that you see something and i like that you brought up the book of enoch it's not in our canon but at the beginning of enoch it says this is for a time to come and That's it right. might just not have been the season for it to have been put in but a lot of people awakening to this book of enoch and some of the interesting things that it is showing us, and it certainly helps us to understand the evil that we're up against. But 
Um, so do you get this backlash, uh, people questioning you and, and upset with your perspective? Well, I, I have, but the thing is that, um, you know, a lot of people in the church really confuse this fourth beast, which, you know, has the power to kill 25% of, destroy 25% of the world in the Antichrist, which destroys a third of the world. And so what we have in our um, kind of church uh, doctrine right now is a, we put the fourth beast and the Antichrist in the blender and hit the button. And so there's not a distinction between uh, the fourth beast, which is this Roman system that we've been under for 2000 years plus, and the Antichrist, which is a future event. Now, the backlash is um, to be expected because we've been wired, our brains have been wired for fear. And what I'm saying is we don't need to fear the fourth beast anymore. We can get in faith and look for what God is doing and ask him, how do I prepare? How do I get ready for this kingdom age? What do I need to do? And that's the best thing I think people can do is say, okay, Lord, if, if we're not just going to get whisked out of here and we actually have to get ready to to lead where does where does that leave me what should i be doing right and i'm meeting more and more people you mentioned fred earlier even in canada there's a group really rising up and saying you know we need to get we need to start taking things back and get ready for this now don't get me wrong the stone judgment is a supernatural event we will not be scratching and scraping and soul winning and doing it out on our own strength. It is a supernatural event, much like the flood was a supernatural event. And the way that God delivered Israel from Egypt, that was very supernatural. Don't get me wrong, this is supernatural, but God is looking for saints that are looking for his work that he's about to do and saying, how can I get ready? And that's really where we need to be. Now, you mentioned the book of Enoch. You know, in the book of Enoch, there are 10 weeks of uh, apocalyptic weeks in the book of Enoch. And you can trace them all the way through. And when you get to week seven, it says that in week seven, that's the generation of iniquity ruling. But then week eight comes and it says the righteous rule. It says there's a judgment event. Okay. And at the end of week seven, it says we rebuild the temple. And then you get to week eight, and nine, I'm sorry, week, I'm sorry, week eight is the kingdom age. Week nine is the millennial reign. And it's very clear in there. Week 10 is the new heaven and new earth. So this kingdom age is actually in the book of Enoch in the apocalyptic weeks. And in fact, that's where I discovered we're supposed to build this temple for our Lord in Jerusalem at the end of the kingdom age. And so it's all there. It's like a blueprint for us um, in this time, but it should not surprise us that God describes what's going to happen next in the Bible because he always has done that. Okay, what about people who say, well, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be, you know? Uh, how do you correlate all of that? Well, so if you think about the days of Noah, you know, everybody likes to focus on um, the judgment but it was a judgment that set up his people, his Noah and his family to rule to the rescued. world. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was a biblical rescue. A biblical rescue is the days of Noah because Noah was oppressed by all of these evil Nephilim all around him. The whole world was evil. And God said, okay, I'm going to judge those people. And guess who was in charge after that? So it was a judgment unto victory. It was not a rescue in the sense that, you know, God took him, you know, took him out and, um, you know, he's like, God gave up and okay, it's gotten too evil. I'm going to take you out of here. No, 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 no. He put him, he gave him the, the, the blueprint for the boat. He got on the boat and when he got off the boat, he was in charge of the world. Mm, I like the way that sounds. Uh, it doesn't feel like we're in charge of anything right now. It feels like people are going to jail for no good reason. Little grandmas actually in, uh, you know, we have political prisoners. We're not seeing justice on the side of righteousness uh, at this hour. It feels like, um, you know, men get to compete against women, although we are seeing some, uh, some definite uh, backlash against that. 
um, as different organizations are beginning to say that they're going to, you know, uphold what a woman is and that you don't get to be a dude and say you're a woman and, and fight in, you know, and, and compete in women's sports and things like this. But in all of this, when our parliament in Canada has the LGBTQ flag flying above it and not a Christian flag, you know, not the veterans flag. Uh, no, it's, it's the LGBTQ flag. And you begin to feel as if evil has won and that this is a mess. Well, it, it, almost every instant of a judgment event in the Bible or a redemption event happened in a time when it just looked really bad. And so when you think about um, this Roman system that we've been under, that Jesus was under, you know, Jesus, 11 out of his 12 disciples were murdered, right? His body would endure 2000 years of brutal persecution. And he knew that. And that's why, it, you know, that's why it really was a temptation when Satan says, see all these kingdoms, they've been given to me. I'll give them to you right now. You don't have to go through that. You don't have to go through losing 11 out of your 12 disciples. You don't have to go through 2000 years of absolute persecution of your body on earth, the church. But the reality is, we gave our authority to Satan in the garden, and there would be a day when it would come back to us. And so that that's a choice that we made in the garden. And even when Jesus came, you know, he knew that it would take another 2000 years before that authority would come back to his to his body. And so he didn't do a thing about Rome at that time. He knew it would take another 2000 years. I lay out how he knew that in my book, the timeline, it was given to us even back then. And so he knew this would happen. And even the Lazarus story, you know, when, um, you know, he said after two days, he's only sleeping, we're going to, we're going to raise him up. And, you know, Martha's like, well, of course he'll get raised up in the very last day. And Jesus is like, no, I have a surprise for you. We're going to raise him right now. And so that surprise that he's going to do for his body is right around the corner. And what we need to do, do is get ready, get our hearts ready, start really um, looking into the scriptures and seeing this and saying, okay, Lord, if this is going to happen, how do I get ready for this? What do I need to do? And that's, that's a place of victory, but it's also a place of expectation. And we do not have to fear the fourth beast Roman system anymore. He's losing his power. Um, he's exposed. I mean, there's more exposure now than there's ever been in our lifetime. And that is the beginning of the death of the fourth beast. The Bible says it would die slowly at first and then bam, suddenly in a single day. And so the slowly at first has already started, but the suddenly single day judgment of this fourth beast is going to be so glorious. And we're going to see the glory fall. We're going to see revival. We're going to see all of the scriptures we've been talking about all these years about that the God's glory would fill the earth. Okay. That those haven't been fulfilled yet, Laura Lynn. And so that's next. And so we need to be looking for that and get excited. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think this is so profound because when I read that he's coming back for this spotless church like you, you know, without spot or wrinkle, I'm like, we are really spotty and wrinkled right now. You know, like I'm so disappointed in the church. I, I see that, uh, you know, Eric Metaxas and, and yourself, uh, I think, have had some sort of uh, um, interview or something. And, um, yeah. you know, Eric Metaxas just put out this video, uh, a letter to the American church. It's just an epic documentary. And it's really a letter to the Canadian church as well. But, um, but the church has failed us. And this isn't the church I think God's very proud of right now. The churches that basically made us look non-essential because they refused to, to like stay open during nonsensical shutdowns and ridiculous mandates and lies that were basically used to shut churches down and they complied en masse. Now, thank God for those few who stood and we know them and we love them and we appreciate those pastors. But this was a colossal epic failure on the part of the church. And so that makes me feel that we're not there yet. And if God is coming back for this spotless bride, um, you know, without wrinkles, uh, we got to iron up our, our, you know, our clothing a little bit more then because we're not there. So what you're saying makes sense to me. 
And I do think that we are beginning to, to see the, uh, the fall and the exposure of the ridiculous side. Even in the United States, we're watching as, you know, Biden is uh, a ridiculous leader. There's just, I, did they have no one else really you know, Benjamin, did they have no one else to put in besides Biden? <laughs> did Obama right. not have anyone? Um, you would have thought he'd try to throw in Michelle, but he keeps saying that's not going to happen. I don't know. Um, but this is not, uh, this is the worst, the, the African-American community, the Spanish community are abandoning him. Even his, you know, the uh, the structures that he has for this migration are failing the country and everyone's seeing it. It's now opening eyes like they're doing it to themselves. So this is good. But I like what you're saying. It's at, at first it's going to kind of happen slowly and then bam, a big exposure. That's right. Well, and it's not just an exposure. It's a it's a total annihilation. You know that when you read Daniel chapter two, it says this stone made without heaven comes in destroys, I mean, just pulverizes this uh, beast system, this whole nasty uh, government that's that you know controls our lives. And it says the mountain will stay in heaven, and that is a new form of government. And so it's going to happen very, very, it, it's going to be undeniable. And it actually talks about in Ezra that this, the seven mountains will be covered with lilies and roses and bless the children, Laura Lynn. So this is a supernatural thing that we'll, we won't even recognize um, the, this world because it'll be run by righteous. And, and the people that are standing up now, the people that are strong now, the people that are fighting tyranny now are going to be promoted big time. And the people hiding in the figurative caves will just be kind of watching you know, from the sideline, but not really be used in a mighty way in leadership in the kingdom age so now's the time it's resume time with the lord now's the time to step up and fight tyranny like you are and so many of us and really be bold and say no this is you know god has got a plan here and i'm i'm excited and i'm let's go let's go god what are we going to do next uh oh i may have lost your audio jt there it is there we go. Um, I'm sorry about that. But before we got started today, you were telling me about um, that you weren't always of this mindset. You were more of a prepper, like, let's let's get ready for ah, whatever happens, right, survivor. <laughs> and you changed. You know, look, uh, I'm a very uh, research-oriented guy. I mean, my first job was in the space program. I, I just love to dig into things, and I'm an engineer, and I like to research it. So when i started to realize that the, the 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 cabal ruling the world actually was devising a plan to destroy humanity it did scare me and i really not knowing what was next uh biblically you know i, I got into fear and one of the things i notice is when you're in fear you don't hear from god you are you're you know it was a very dark period of of prepping and buying camping gear and, and just getting ready for the worst case scenario. And it was a very quiet period from heaven because when you're in fear, Laura Lynn, you just don't hear God's voice the way uh, you do when you're in faith and you're in expectation. But praise God, I was able to snap out of that when I saw in the word of God that actually, yes, the enemy plans horrible things, but then Jesus interrupts those plans. He's the lion out of the forest. He judges this fourth beast. And then he raises up a man out of the sea as part of his way to redeem humanity. And, you know, people that criticize Trump and are not on board, all I would say is this. God used Cyrus in the Old Testament to deliver Israel. They did not pick their deliverer. You know, they did not pick the person that was going to set them free from Babylon. God picked that person. And so I see God's hand on Trump, as flawed as he may be, he is God's man for this hour, and we're going to see more of Trump in the future. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very glad to, to hear you say that. Uh, they've tried everything uh, to, to keep him away. And although, of course, uh, as you say, a flawed man, that was the same as Cyrus. He didn't serve the Lord God, right? Um, That's right. And so, so 
And I, I like what you're saying that we don't get to pick our deliverers and there is no perfect man. And how shocking it is to now find out some of the things that we're finding out about our governments. Like, uh, I think that there's more blackmail and bribery going on and more sexual impropriety that's behind the scenes uh, with a lot of uh, people. And they're, it's being used against them to cause them to act in ways that is not what they'd want to do. But they're being bad governors and and bad people in Parliament. Um, I know recently Marjorie Taylor Greene had a conversation with Tucker Carlson regarding, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but it was a half hour of riveting discussion because everyone is asking what's going on with the Speaker of the House because he's not actually acting in the way that uh, they thought he would be, like who they thought he would be. So people begin questioning what's going on behind the scenes. but. With Trump, everything, it's kind of like out there, you know, improprieties, things, and, and false allegations have come against him, um, all kinds of things. But the thing about it is you can see the hand of God on him because he keeps beating everything. It's as if supernaturally there's a protection and he walks through the fire. Well, Laura Lynn, even that is in the Bible. It says in, in this man out of the sea in, in 2 Ezra, it says that the whole the four winds of heaven would attack him and they would attack him afraid, but that he would defeat them with the law and that he would have this, you know, sparks flying out of his mouth. I mean, it mentions his, his, his tongue three or four times, uh, it, it, you know, the mean tweets are in the Bible. I mean, it, it's just, it's amazing how God knew all everything that would happen. In fact, when Jesus, you know, walks out of the forest as a lion into Ezra and talks to the fourth beast, he basically says, I raised you up for this time so that I could do what I want to do for my people. And that's exactly the way it was with Egypt. You know, Egypt was in power. Uh, they had all the gold and silver in the world after the famine. Everybody came to Egypt to buy silver and gold. They had these giant stacks of silver and gold accumulated on the backs of, of the interpretation of Joseph's dream. God raised up Egypt so that Egypt could be the vehicle of blessing for Israel. He put Egypt in charge to basically accumulate the goods that he planned to give to, to Israel and to set them up for their kingdom. And so when you think about these families that are so wealthy and have just been, you know, accumulating assets on the backs of um, God's saints all these hundreds of years in the cabal that just thinks they, uh, they, they'll never be judged. Um, all I can say is God's going to use that whole system to bless us. You know, the Bible says the wealth of the winner, uh, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. The last time we saw a fulfillment of that scripture was in Egypt when God got Israel out of there and gave them the silver and gold. But that scripture is for today as well. And so he's using the mechanisms, if you will, of this fourth B system to set up his people. I love it. Uh, Benjamin Thomas, thank you very, very much. Thank you for your books. Uh, we just encourage everyone, would they get them on Amazon? You can get them really anywhere, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, they're, they're everywhere at this point. Okay, I'm looking forward to reading that and I thank you so much for your time. Let's do this again as we see the kingdom begin to come in. I hope that we'll have uh, many years perhaps of chit chatting should the Lord not return. <laughs> and uh, so thank you very much. We appreciate uh, this encouragement that you're bringing. It's great to be here, Laura Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, how nice. Uh, I, I mean, I'm hearing this more and more, this kingdom age that we don't have to feel, uh, you know, worried that justice is not coming. This is just sort of a bad season when it doesn't feel like we're getting very much justice, but may God be glorified and, and we, we need to trust him until it all comes in. I appreciate all of your comments in the, uh, you know, in the, um, in the feeds today because it's nice to see what you're some of you embracing it some of you a little skeptical but listen can we all just have conversations and can we just keep moving forward and trying to find what god is saying to us in this day and age before i go today uh let's run uh, the u.s defense secretary lloyd austin uh, jt can we do that one um he's um he's talking about whether israel is committing genocide or not take a look 
Secretary Austin, thank you for acknowledging in response to Senator Wicker that uh, Hamas committed war crimes on October 7th and has been committing them every day since by using human shields. Um, I want to address what the protesters raised earlier. Uh, is Israel committing genocide in Gaza? We don't have any evidence of genocide uh, being uh, created. Uh, so that's a, that's a no. Israel's not committing genocide in Gaza. Uh, we don't have evidence of that, to Thank my you. knowledge. Yeah. Better than Director Burns and Director Haynes did last year, last month at the Intelligence Committee when they dodged that question. Um, you stand accused by those protesters of greenlighting genocide. Would you like to respond to that accusation? Uh, what I would say, uh, Senator Cotton, from the very beginning is that we uh, committed to help assist uh, in, uh, Israel in defending its, uh, uh, its territory and its people by providing security assistance. Mm. So there is so much uh, that is being said, so much propaganda that is going on in the, um, you know, in the mainstream media. And I like to just remind everyone that genocide um, a killing, a psychopathic streak of killing took place October 7th. And that's why we're here. And that's why Israel cannot live at peace with sworn enemies that say that they will do it again and again. And so it's fascinating that, uh, you know, a couple million people have already left Gaza. People followed the trail. Israel dropped leaflets telling them how they could get out of the area. And uh some choosing not to do that very very interesting and some of it goes back to the belief in their hearts that if they're martyred if their children are martyred then you know they get a place in heaven and this is a difficult religious war that is going on may god help us may god bless israel may god keep innocent people safe and may he help to work out this incredible time that's going on right now. Okay, um, my website is laurelin.tv. And I just thank all of you for those of you willing to help us to donate, to do great things. Uh, we had something to run on Finance Minister Christia Freeland, but we'll save that for the next show. Um, we're, we're just so grateful. We do this because we love you and because it's our calling and our ministry to bring the truth and to share the truth. And if you value that, Will you go to our website and uh, become maybe a monthly partner or donate a one-time donation? You can also donate anonymously. And uh, I'm offering my book, which is Relentless Redemption, my story, to anyone who will sign up for $20 or more per month. We're going to get that book out to you. And Dominique's taking care of all of that. I just appreciate her so much. And um, we value you. My website is also Laura Lynn, oh no, LLTT, the new one, super easy. LLTT live at pm.me. LLTT live at pm.me. You can email me there. You can also send um, uh, e transfers if that would like be the way that you'd like to support us. We appreciate you so much. We can't do it without you. Box 48184. Queensboro, New Westminster, V3M0A7. For any of you who would like to um, uh, buy and purchase uh, silver and gold, we recommend Sun City Silver. In this day when, you know, they we mentioned silver and gold today, and in this day when things are a little bit crazy and uh, our money is uh, basically built on, uh, our money's built uh, on, on photocopies, it's not the greatest. Well, I thank you today. Um, these are perilous times. It's difficult to wade through everything. It's difficult to know exactly what the truth is and what it's not. It's difficult to not be in contradiction with one another about it because there's so many different ways to view things. When I was growing up, our biggest fear was it was all going to hell in a handbasket, and then the Lord would return as a thief in the night. We wouldn't know, and we better make sure that we weren't in the movie theater. Because <laughs> my mom was pretty sure that if you were in a movie theater, you weren't going to be able to make it. Oh, so ah, she got over that in her later years, and she found out they're just watching movies in a movie theater. Sometimes, it, and it's not the, mov the movie, it's the content of the movie. 
So, you know, we talked a bit about Daniel today, Daniel 2, and I want to read this amazing um, part of Daniel 2, the end of 19. Uh, well, okay, actually we'll start at, yeah, 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision, and then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Oh, it's gonna be great when we get to worship and praise God forever and ever. In these days when it seems like evil is just, you know, taking over and is getting away with everything, Let's understand something powerful that the lion of the tribe of Judah shall return and it is going to be spectacular. And he is to be praised forever and ever. And Daniel said he changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise. I want to be wise. You know, I'm blonde. But I have to say that a prayer that I've been praying for many, many years is, Lord, would you give me wisdom? James says, the book of James in our Bible says, it is, it is the one thing God says, if you will ask for me wisdom, I will give it to you liberally. So I don't always feel like I'm the smartest kid on the block, but I do know that I ask God that he would show me his heart he would show me his ways that I would be one of the deserters of the times. And I pray that every day when I bring you information that we are able to discern together. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you God of my ancestors you have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. And of course, Daniel had this incredible gift to understand dreams. I pray that whatever your gift is, so many of you, you're so smart. You're so wise. You're kind. You're loving. And sometimes you take heat because of who you are, because you're a gentle soul. Know this, God sees you. He's giving you wisdom as you ask for him. Let's make a special effort today to ask the good Lord to give us wisdom and discernment in these last days. God bless. You know, it's not easy to deliver the truth of what our sick world is doing, but for some of us, we feel that we have no choice. Because if we are silent about these abominable things, then we are letting evil go unchecked and we cannot do that. For those of you wonderful people who are writing me and are sharing your encouragement, I am deeply grateful. Thank you for all the letters that you've been sending. Thank you for the donations and the support. I found out that in order to speak the truth, you have to become very, very strong. If you would go to my website at www.lauralyn.tv, you'll find all of the ways that you can contact me. Remember, my friends, all is well. All is well. Thanks for joining me.